boring introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk today about acute stroke, um, and we'll get started. I'm, I'm designed this to not take up the whole time that we are given, so if there's questions you guys have, please send them through the thing and we can talk through them. All right, so one of the main questions for me to answer is, why does this matter? For me as a stroke neurologist, I do this every day. But one of the things that I find important is to make sure that other non-neurologists know why this is important and why we do what we do. Um, so we're going to talk about two basic things. We're going to spend the bulk of this time together talking about ischemic stroke, some like ischemic stroke 101 sort of basics, the acute management of ischemic stroke, and then a couple of slides on workup and secondary prevention. And we're going to end this by talking about intracranial hemorrhage. Again, some basics and some acute management. So starting with ischemic stroke, this is a case for this half of this. Um, it's a little bit hard to have you guys call out stuff, so we can just talk through it and I'll answer my own questions as like a crazy person talking to myself. All right, so a 71-year-old man with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes presents to the ER after being found by his wife with left-sided weakness and left facial droop. They went to bed last night at 10.30 p.m., and Shu awoke at 6.30 a.m. to walk the dogs. When he was not awake at 7.15, she came to find him, and he was tangled up in the sheets. She noted his facial droop and called EMS. So you're seeing this guy in the ER. It's now 7.50. So hold the thought for a second. Why does this matter? So the, the, there is such an enormous burden of disease with stroke. We were thrilled in this 2016 update of this heart disease and stroke statistics where we drop from number four to number five on the causes of mortality in the United States. Um, but even so, stroke is still the leading cause of disability of adults in the United States. 800,000 people a year about have a new stroke or recurrent stroke, which is astronomical in my mind. Um, and someone in the, in the U.S. has a stroke every 40 seconds and dies from a stroke every four minutes. Um, the most recent data that I could find was back from 2011-2012 and the cost of stroke per year is $33 billion, both healthcare dollars and lost, lost wages, that sort of thing. So this is a, an awesome little paper published about 10 years ago called Time is Brain Quantified. So it was looking at for every minute of large vessel occlusion, i.e. ICA, MCA, etc., 2 million neurons, 14 billion synapses, and 7.5 and miles of myelinated fiber are destroyed. So we always say our mantra is, time is brain. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is why we do this um, and why some of these therapies have to be done rapidly. So just I'm all about getting terminology straight. So some fundamentals on ischemic stroke. So by definition, ischemic stroke is an episode of neurological dysfunction caused by focal, cerebral, spinal, or retinal infarction, which itself infarction is defined as cell death attributable to ischemia either by imaging or by clinical evidence. So a few terms that get thrown around fairly interchangeably, infarct, ischemia or ischemic, and stroke. So the word stroke, to me as I talk about stroke, is a description of a clinical syndrome. This patient has aphasia and right side of weakness, thus the patient has a left MCA stroke. But we often hear people talking, at least in my line of work, I hear people talking a lot about oh, the MRI shows a stroke, so da-da-da. The MRI doesn't show a stroke, the patient has a stroke. The MRI shows an infarct, um, and ischemia is in the spectrum of cell death. It's tissue at, at risk of dying that hasn't yet infarcted. Another term that I hear commonly is CVA, which is a term that every neurologist has chest pain when we hear it, because it's like the most nondescriptive nothing term. And I think that it is uncommon for strokes to be the A, which is accident. Stroke happened because of hypertension and AFib and whatever. Um, so to me, that's a term that you'll never hear a neurologist use. So I have this, um, which is a, some representative images of different varieties of stroke. In the bulk of this time, we're going to talk uh, about the different varieties of ischemic stroke and sort of A, how to contextualize that and make it make sense, and then B, how that informs what we do for patients who present with stroke. So top left here, these are all MRI, DWI sequences from MRI scans. So top left here is a right MCA occlusion, whether it's from local disease or carotid disease. These next two are lacunar strokes. This one in the middle here in the right pons, here on the right in the periventricular white matter. The bottom left 
you can see that there is infarcts both in the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, as well as the anterior and posterior circulation. So that's a good bet for a cardioembolic or some sort of proximal embolic source. And this last one here, you see it's nicely in the boundary between the ACA territory, which is at the midline, and the MCA territory, which is here more laterally. So this is a watershed stroke, often in the setting of carotid narrowing plus hypotension. So back in 1993, there was this thing called the TOAST trial. But it actually ended up being a negative trial. It looked at a heparinoid product in the treatment of acute stroke. So negative trial, but it was actually the most important thing this trial did was help us, again, contextualize what subtypes of stroke there are because we think about them very differently. So it separated the ischemic stroke, this is ischemic stroke only, into five different categories. The big three are these first ones large artery atherosclerosis, which is about 30% of stroke, cardioembolism, which is about 20% of stroke, and small vessel occlusion or lacunar disease, which is 15%. The last two categories, the smallest is this fourth category, stroke of other determined etiology, it means you figure out what causes it and it's not one of those three things. Um, or the fifth one, stroke of undetermined etiology, or cryptogenic stroke, is unfortunately still you know, the tag for first place as the biggest cause of stroke. So let's zoom in and talk about this in detail. So in talking about large artery atherosclerosis, this is a great picture that shows how people get strokes. So things like carotid plaque, whether it's plaque flicking off and going up into the brain to cause a stroke, or flow reducing stenosis from, again, from carotid stenosis. Those are two that we see probably most commonly, but also I would add to that aortic arch plaque and something that has gotten a lot of, of interest recently is intracranial atherosclerosis. One of the things that I find interesting is the racial differences in stroke in, in this category even, that it tends to be that Caucasian people tend to get extracranial disease, i.e. carotid bifurcation, and non-Caucasian people, typically described as African-American and people of Asian descent, get intracranial atherosclerosis. Presumably some genetic basis to that, nobody really exactly knows why. So that's category one, large artery disease. Category two, cardioembolism or cardioembolic disease. The prototypical cause of stroke in this, in this category is atrial fibrillation, but it's also things like bad valvular disease, LV thrombus, and I put aortic arch plaque on this as well. And then last is small vessel occlusion, again, or lacunar stroke which is penetrating artery disease of the small blood vessels coming off the main trunk of the MCA most typically. So one of the things that as I explain this or think about the pathophysiology of this, the vessels in the brain have an amazing capability to autoregulate, to take it from wide blood vessels like the carotid to narrow through, you know, narrow arteries through arterioles, et cetera. The, the difficult thing about these small vessels, the lenticular striates are the most common ones, is that I, I always think about it as it's like a little gravel road coming off of I-75, that if traffic's going 70 miles an hour to make that quick little right turn to get on the gravel road, there's not the normal, like the off ramp, then the next road and the next road is going from big highway to little tiny vessel, and the normal autoregulatory auto things that the vessels do, they can't do with these small vessels. So those are the big three main causes of stroke. So talking about this tiny little sliver, other determined etiology, I always think about this through Virchow's triad, right? Stasis, endothelial injury, hypercoagulability. So putting into things like this, dissection, common cause of stroke in young people, or other hypercoagulable states are the biggies we see in this category. And then last, which is for me, again, as a stroke physician is the most frustrating, is cryptogenic stroke, which is still unfortunately 30% of people who have stroke. So it's either because you've done a huge workup and you found nothing, or there are multiple competing causes, i.e. someone has bad carotid disease and also AFib, and you don't know which one of the which one of the two things caused the stroke. Or I get people referred to my clinic a lot that have had an MRI showing a stroke, they get discharged from the hospital, and they get referred to me for a second opinion on stroke when they haven't really had a workup that's been done yet. So let's go back to this case here. So a 71-year-old guy with multiple vascular risk factors. Um, he and his wife had gone to bed at 10.30. She woke up at 6.30, found him at 7.15 with left facial droop and left side of weakness. 
they bring them to the ER, it's now 750. So here at Vanderbilt, we call it a stroke, a stroke alert when these patients come into the ER. So a stroke alert gets called in this NIH stroke scale, which is a score we use to, to identify the main deficits in stroke patients. His stroke scale is 14, which is a pretty decent stroke syndrome. So what first? Always the right answer, ABCs. Make sure that he's not going to imminently demise as you're waiting to figure out what's going on. So those are all fine. You do a finger stick, it's 188. All right, so now what? Always the first answer in these acute people present with acute neurologic changes, a non-con head CT. So this scan to me looks perfectly normal. His head's a little off kilter. Um, it, it, the things that you, my eyes get drawn to at least are a little bit of asymmetry in the temporal lobe. You can see his right one more than you can see his left one a little bit. And this little bright stuff down here, which you might imagine could be hemorrhage, but it's just calcified choroid plexus. So this is a normal CT scan. So this has got a normal CT scan. He was found 45 minutes ago or 35 minutes ago. Can you give him IV TPA? Let's talk about TPA for a second. So IV TPA for acute ischemic stroke, AIS, acute ischemic stroke, was not approved until the mid-90s. So it's not really been around all that long for acute stroke. So it was this big NINDS trial that looked at IV TPA in the zero to three hour window with a bunch of contraindications recent surgery, recent brain surgery, trauma, previous hemorrhage, that sort of thing. And it was very rapidly FDA approved and has been in universal use since then. So this graphic on the right um, is one that I love to talk through with patients and their families. I do something called teleneurology, where we have contracts with a bunch of hospitals in the state who have limited neurology coverage or no neurology coverage. And because we see lots of stroke patients at Vanderbilt, we have a lot of experience to help these smaller hospitals who may give IV TPA five or six times a month or five or six times a year, or we do it you know, 10 times a week, that sort of thing. And people are often very reluctant to use IV TPA and will sometimes try to find reasons not to give it. So the way that I talk through that conversation with patients and families and even ER providers is to, to reference this, this figure, sort of the information about it. So this is looking at the 1995 NINDS trials for IVTPA. Um, so basically, this is 100 people getting IVTPA. <clears throat> and you can see that in the dark green, 13 of them are normal or nearly normal because of TPA. Another 19 are better. So the vast majority of these patients have no change. Six, these little minus signs here, have symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. Two of them are worse because of that, and one of them dies because of it. So as I couch it to patients and families, I say, of course, this is a very strong clot-busting, blood-thinning medication, so there's a risk of bleeding associated with it, but your risk of doing well because of this medication is 10 times more than your risk of doing badly because of this medication. And that often sort of mitigates some of the fear that people have. So that's IVTPA in the normal three-hour window. So there was a second trial called the ECAS-3 trial, E stands for European, that was done in Europe, obviously looking at IVTPA in the three to four and a half hour window. Um, so this is in wide practice by ERs, it's in wide practice by neurologists, but not FDA approved. Um, so it's the same list of contraindications, recent surgery, that sort of thing, um, with four additional things. If you have a previous stroke and you have diabetes, if you have a high stroke skill, generally 25 is the number we use, age over 80 or any warfarin use, you're ineligible to get TPA in that extended window. So in the regular window, if you take Coumadin, but your INR is 1.2, you're fine. But in this extended window, you can't, can't get TPA. So let's go back to our patient. He has a normal CT scan. Do we give him TPA? No. So the main thing that we talk about is the last known normal time. It's not the time the symptoms are found. It's the time that the patient was last known to be in his or her usual state of health. There are something interesting about stroke and MIs and other sort of thrombotic things is that it typically happen in the morning. There's a normal diurnal variation to something called pi, this enzyme PI1 that makes us all more hypercoagulable in the morning. So most likely he was found at 7.15. Most likely this happened at some time in 5 and 6 a.m. Um, so he probably developed symptoms in the previous three hours. But because his last known normal time was not since 10 o'clock last night, IVTPA is unsafe. So what do we do now? Say, sorry, here's an aspirin, good luck. 
So maybe 15 years ago we would have, but we have a lot of additional therapies now that we use. So here, part of our stroke, our, our stroke protocol when patients come in as a stroke alert, they get a non-contrast CT, and then they get a CTA. And as you can see pretty clearly here, on the left, top of his carotid looks great. His right, I'm sorry, his left ACA looks fine. His left MCA looks fine. His right ACA probably filling through this ACOM, but you don't see the top of his carotid, and you definitely don't see a right MCA here. So this CTA gets read as a proximal right M1 occlusion. So what do we do? Endovascular therapy, which has really been an incredible advance in stroke care in the last few years. So even as early as the late 90s, early 2000s, there was some endovascular treatment for acute stroke. So there was IATPA, like going up with a, with a catheter and dripping TPA on a, the face of a clot in people who couldn't get IV TPA. And there were also trials of thrombectomy. Um, so those were sort of, those worked sort of well. And then in 2013 at the big stroke conference, there were three trials released. They were all negative for benefit of endovascular therapy. Um, every interventionist, every stroke neurologist was like, that's nonsense, we do this all the time and these patients walk out of the hospital, that can't possibly be true. We just gotta redo these studies in a way that makes more sense. Um, and so they released five new trials um, now to almost two years ago um, that were all incredibly overwhelmingly positive. Um, and we'll talk about some more specifics in a minute, but these were super incredible trials and have really advanced stroke care hugely in the last couple of years. They're all different based on the imaging modalities they used. Some use non-contrast CTs, some use MRIs, some use CTAs, um, which is beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but the results were the same. Basically, the number needed to treat, i.e. how many procedures you have to do for one person to have a good outcome, was two or three, and there's almost nothing in medicine that that's good. Even CEA for, for symptomatic chronic disease is six, IV TPA is eight, it's 14 in the extended window, it's two or three in these trials, which is pretty incredible. So what do we do now? Do we send the patient for intervention? Well, some people might, um, but here we do something called a CT perfusion, which helps gives us some more information on exactly what's going on. Is this, the ship has sailed and this is all infarct, or is there ischemic brain that we can help rescue with an intervention? So when we do it here, we get this composite scan with green and red, we make it like totally idiot proof so that when I get called by the residents at three o'clock in the morning, I can look and say, yeah, it looks pretty good, all right. Um, but let's talk about how this works for a minute. So I will preface this by saying that to me, like math and physics are like the block goes down the ramp and there's a couple arrows coming off of it. So I am far from the best person to explain such a thing. But this is how I understand how perfusion imaging works. So on this graph is looking at one particular voxel of the, of the brain parenchyma over time. And you can see the blood comes in and out in this bell-shaped sort of thing. It slowly trickles in and then a big bolus and then out like that. So there's several variables that we look at on these patients. So the most important one is CBV here, cerebral blood volume. How much blood is getting to that voxel over the course of 10 seconds or 20 seconds, whatever. CBF, cerebral blood flow, is the slope of this curve, volume over time. And then the third, a third, a third and fourth variables, MTT and TTP, mean transit time and time to peak, is how long it takes the mean, um, in assuming a normal distribution, the mean, you know, like red blood cell in this, in this curve to get to where that tissue is being supplied. So this is a normal brain. So Let's talk about what happens in ischemia. So in parts of the brain that we've referred to as ischemic, this curve sort of gets flattened and stretched out because blood is getting to the voxel of interest by collaterals. If there's an occluded MCA, maybe it's going through leptomeningeal collaterals or through a PCOM or whatever, but it's just taking, lo it's taking longer for blood to get there. So the mean transit time or the time to peak increases the cerebral blood flow decreases because the slope gets flattened out, but the CBV, cerebral blood volume, doesn't change. It's the same, the same amount of blood is getting to that particular voxel, which is why the, that part of the brain is ischemic and not yet infarcted, which happens when that curve gets flattened out even more. The mean transit time goes way up, the cerebral blood flow, CBF, goes way down, 
and then the cerebral blood flow goes down. So if you look through these perfusion maps, you can see a few things. So number one, again, the most important one is the CBV. And you can see sort of looking side to side, and eh, it looks about the same. Here you can see maybe it's a little bluer here, which is lower CBV here, and posteriorly on the right. But it looks pretty symmetric. Looking at CBF, if low is blue and high is red, you can see CBF is a little bit decreased here in the whole right hemisphere and looks normal, normally elevated here on the left side. And then you really see it dramatically on this time to peak and mean transit time where they're way increased. The colors are backwards on these, but it's way increased in the right hemisphere compared to the left hemisphere. Blood's still getting there, it's just taking longer for it to get there. So when we put this together, we do these green and red things green being increased, in this little figure here, increased mean transit time and normal CBV, right? Blood, all the blood that needs together is still getting there, it just takes longer. And then red is increased mean transit time and reduced CBV. Blood's taking a long time to get there, and not all the blood that needs to get there is actually getting there. So this patient has a small infarct core, shown here in red, and a huge penumbra, green, which is the tissue that is savable by endovascular therapy. The tissue that's in red has already infarcted and the ship has sailed and retrieving a, doing a thrombectomy is not going to fix that part of his brain. But the green stuff is the savable stuff, which is why we do this. So in showing a picture of this patient's angiogram, you see here this is a carotid injection. It goes up, 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 up. It looks normal, normal. There's a gap here because of dental fillings, not, not anything pathologic. It goes up, 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 and you see ACA looks perfectly normal here. MCA, abrupt cutoff right there. And then here, post-thrombectomy, using a, a stent retriever most commonly, blood is coming up the carotid, looks normal, 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 normal. ACA looks great. MCA, not perfect, but certainly a zillion times better than the pre-procedural images. So some highlights of the workup we do for these patients color coded here by the variety of stroke subtype. So for cardiac, for cardioembolic reasons, we look at an echo. We do prolonged cardiac monitoring. So back even when I was in residency not that long ago, the standard of care was just a 24-hour Holter monitor, occasional EKGs, that sort of thing. But in the last two or three or four years, there have been big clinical trials released saying that prolonged monitoring really increases your chance by about threefold of finding occult AFib which is a huge stroke risk factor, as we know. And it even we monitor these patients for months or longer, and it only takes six minutes of AFib, even over the course of a month or over the course of years, to increase your stroke risk. So finding that is hugely, is hugely helpful and really changes our management dramatically. Next, I call them risk factor labs. Lacuna stroke or small vessel stroke, I think of as a risk factor sort of stroke. When we look at a lipid panel and a hemoglobin A1C, in thinking about large artery disease, we do vessel imaging, typically a CTA of the head and neck. And then in thinking about that fourth category, the other determined etiology, hypercoag workup, genetic testing, a zillion things can be put in that category. And then last, before we move to hemorrhage, I want to talk about secondary prevention for a minute. Um, as I sort of think about this, I put it like A, B, C, D, E, F is how I make sure I cover all my bases when I talk about this with patients. So number one, antithrombotic therapy, i.e. antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulation. In the vast majority of stroke patients, aspirin or Plavix, um, i.e. antiplatelet monotherapy, is sufficient. It's very rare that we use anticoagulation unless somebody has proven atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation or a proven hypercoagulable state. That's number one. Number two, blood pressure control is the number one modifiable risk factor for stroke prevention. As you lower blood pressure, even in people without the diagnosis of hypertension, you reduce stroke risk. Same for LDL, um, moving on to C, cholesterol. Statins are really the mainstay of, of therapy in this. Um, and for every few points you reduce LDL, you again, you decrease your stroke risk. D for diabetes. Um, here in Middle Tennessee, we see that very commonly. Um, and managing that as another modifiable way to reduce stroke risk. E for endarterectomy, we all learn, I certainly learned in med school about the ACAST trial and the NASET trial and all these things with carotid disease. 
Um, those trials were done largely in the 80s and 90s before statins were in super wide usage. So what we do differs a little bit than when those trials looked at back, you know, 30 years ago now. But basically, if someone has symptomatic carotid disease, i.e., they have an episode either a stroke or a TIA of right-sided weakness and aphasia, and they're found to have an 85% left carotid stenosis as a clear patient who would benefit from endarterectomy. The, the big, another question is, let's say you find a patient who's neurologically asymptomatic, who has a bad stenosis of one of those vessels, that is becoming less and less of a reason to do a CEA. And then last is F for risk factors. Um, the main ones that I think about here are obstructive sleep apnea, um, which basically increases your stroke risk by a factor of two to three, even independent of all other risk factors. So that's something that I screen for in all stroke patients. Easy questions like, do you fall asleep when you're watching TV? Do you fall asleep if you're a passenger in a car? Are you snoring loudly? That sort of thing. And then other common stuff, diet, exercise, um, smoking is huge. Um, so that is the, that, that's how I, again, that's how I think about secondary prevention. So let's shift gears here and talk about intracranial hemorrhage. So to separate intracerebral hemorrhage and intracranial hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, a focal collection of blood within the brain parenchyma or the ventricular system not caused by trauma, and then intracranial hemorrhage includes both intraaxial, i.e. intracerebral hemorrhage, and extraaxial hemorrhage, subarachnoid, subdural, epidural hemorrhages. So some context for this, even though ICH is only about 10% of acute stroke, the one-month mortality from hemorrhage is astronomical, 40%. And of these patients, 75% of them have died or are extremely disabled at one year. Unfortunately, there's really no treatment that is proven to be effective. And once intra cerebral hemorrhage happens, you can't change where, the human, where it happens, you can't change how big it is. It's a matter of managing the secondary downstream effects from what the hemorrhage is going to potentially cause. These patients often present with hemorrhage, I'm sorry, they present with hemodynamics, but often present with headache, um, and their blood pressure is usually elevated at presentation. If you think about, um, thinking about the inter intracranial contents, um, as you elevate your ICP from a new space-occupying lesion, your MAP has to go up to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. So if someone comes in with a blood pressure of 230 and new neurologic symptoms, to me that always triggers thinking about that this could be a hemorrhage. Uh, number three, decreased level of consciousness for the same exact reason. As your ICP goes up, your MAP can only go up so high to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. These patients often have a decreased level of consciousness. Vomiting is common, and seizures are about one in five or so of these patients with intra, intracerebral hemorrhage. So how do we evaluate these patients? Again, always ABCs. You're much more likely to need to intubate someone who has an intracranial hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage in the ER before next steps because they're sleepier and sicker. Thinking about time of onset, thinking about symptoms and progression, is this someone who's had left side of weakness for a week and a half and now has worse left side of weakness? Or is this someone who is sitting, you know, eating a red lobster and then all of a sudden, boom, develop facial droop and right side of weakness? Um, other things like vascular risk factors, comorbidities, what medications are they on, in particular, blood thinning medications, aspirin, Plavix, Coumadin, et cetera. And as you evaluate these patients, getting good lab evaluation, do they have a coagulopathy because of bad liver disease? Do they have zero platelets as their INR10? Those are the things you have to know very quickly. And then a good neuro exam, you know, you don't have to go crazy and do a 45-minute evaluation of this patient's mental status, but something to know a good baseline exam so that you can have something to track over time. So let's talk about the different varieties of hemorrhage. Um, first is an epidural hemorrhage, most commonly caused by a severed middle meningeal artery. A classic clinical picture is some sort of trauma um, with a patient having a lucid interval, oh no, I'm fine, I just hit my head skiing, I'm good, and then all of a sudden, boom, they decompensate. Um, imaging findings of this lens-shaped biconvex hematoma. And because this is bound by suture lines, um, these hemorrhages are pretty small. Next is a subdural hemorrhage caused by ruptured bridging veins, typically in elderly patients, um, often on anticoagulation. 
And these can be spontaneous or they can be, again, anticoagulation associated. And there's this big crescent because these hemorrhages are not bound by suture lines. Sometimes they can become chronic and they look, they look more hypodense than hyperdense. Um, but this is an acute subdural in this picture here. Next is subarachnoid hemorrhage, usually caused by a ruptured barioneurism in the circle of Willis. Um, the clinical picture, the worst headache of your life. We all have had the worst headache of our lives at some point. But these patients are typically doing something or doing nothing and then out of nowhere, like lightning bolt or like thunderclap is how the headache starts. These patients decompensate very rapidly. They have very high mortality if they're not managed quickly. As far as imaging findings, blood is found diffusely, whether it's a small amount or a large amount, but in the subarachnoid space, sometimes with extension into the brain parenchyma or into the ventricles. And then the last one that I want to talk about is intraparenchymal hemorrhage and talk about the two main causes of this. So there are lots of causes. The, again, the main ones are hypertension and CAA, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So clinical picture, pretty similar to ischemic stroke, patient with the right risk factors who develops focal neurologic findings. Um, in hypertensive hemorrhage, which is this top picture here, these hemorrhages tend to be deep because the same lenticular stride perforating vessels that we talked about with lacunar stroke, those are the ones that get affected in hypertensive hemorrhage. Most commonly, thalamus, putamen, pons, cerebellum are the most common places to find that. So hypertensive hemorrhage is deep structures. And then here is a patient with CAA, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And these are typically cortical or right at the cortical subcortical junction. You can see there's one big hemorrhage here on the right, a few little micro hemorrhages here, and one sort of less dominant hemorrhage here on the left side. So then these patients come in, what do you do? You've done the ABCs thing, you've gotten figured out what's going on, so how do we take care of these patients? Um, as a neurologist, I don't take care of patients in, in, typically with epidural or subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhages as those are surgical or neurosurgical emergencies for those patients to be taken care of. But some fundamentals exist regardless of what variety of hemorrhage the patient has. So number one is blood pressure management, um, which is probably the most important thing you can do acutely. There's a lot of debate even in the neurology community on what the best target blood pressure is for these patients. But I think for me, the, the, the most important thing is to get these patients as close to normotensive as you can as quickly as you can. Even someone who comes in with a blood pressure of 250, there's no risk in reducing that patient if they have a proven hemorrhage. There's no risk associated with getting their blood pressure down quickly. If someone is chronically hypertensive and comes in with a headache, and that's another thing about bringing it down slowly, but if someone who has a new intracranial hemorrhage, blood pressure management is the most important thing you can do. Number two is the reversal of coagulopathy. So someone comes in who's on Coumadin, their INR is 14, and they have a big hemorrhage. You got to get their INR corrected as quickly as possible. So here at Vanderbilt, we use something called Kcentra, which is a PCC, prothrombin complex concentrate, that has some of the coagulation factors in it that reduces patients, that normalizes patients' INR within a few minutes. Vitamin K and FFP don't work quite as well and take a little bit longer, um, but can be part of this management as well. And then there's a lot of discussion now in the literature too about the NOACs, the novel oral anticoagulation medications. Um, people were initially worried about using them because of their irreversibility, but now there are individual reversal agents for many of, the, of the, these novel agents. Other supportive measures, keeping them normothermic, keeping them euglycemic. Um, seizure medications, we often, I always call it the hemorrhage rally pack. Patients will end up at another hospital. They find a big hemorrhage, they give them some steroids, they give them some dilantin and send them. Neither one of those has proven to show any benefit in hemorrhage patients. In fact, they can do harm to those patients. These patients, again, they often have seizures and can sometimes have seizures at presentation, but you should withhold seizure medications until they actually develop seizures. And then last is surgery. Again, like I mentioned, epidural and subdural hemorrhages are generally operatively managed. Subarachnoid hemorrhage can be operatively or endovascularly managed. Um, and it's rare, but it happens for intraparenchymal hemorrhage patients to get surgery, if it, which um, often in the temporal lobe of it's super, superficial, but in general, it's medical management for those patients.
So that's what I've got, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have, if you have any. Great. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. That was phenomenal. So again, if you have any questions that you'd like Dr. Zimmerman to answer, just type them in the text box below. We'd be happy to field any of those. I don't think we have any yet. So I think there may be a few questions in the chat box. Um, right. Let's have a look at the chat box. Okay. Cool. Okay. So I have a question about perfusion scanning. How much time is lost to acquire additional imaging, and what is the consensus on using this algorithm? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say it's a very institution-dependent thing. Where I trained in residency, the MRI was the, was the diagnostic test that we used to identify patients who would benefit from endovascular therapy. It takes about three or four minutes. Um, so in total, the CT, CT, CD perfusion, even, even all those three things together are less time than an MRI. Um, so that's what, that's what we do. Again, there are some people who would advocate that in the patient with the right clinical situation, with the right vessel imaging, that if they have a normal aspect score, which is a score to like, quantify areas, like how much if early ischemic changes you can see, if someone has a normal enough non-con CT and the right vessel imaging, then you should take that patient. Um, again, we use, that's what we do at our institution, um, but it's not, a super, it's not a super long study that takes, that loses too much time. And in, the, in these patients, once they've had a non-con CT that's normal, then they start getting IV TPA, which is really what gets the, the ball rolling in terms of that reperfusion. Great. Next question is, how do you counsel patients on choosing between uh, endarterectomy versus carotid stinting? Yeah, another good question. And another that also tends to be a proceduralist preference. Um, I'll say there's very clear patients where they should get a CEA, younger patients who have no other medical problems, um, who have easy access to their carotid um, versus someone who has a high operative risk. But in, the, in a lot of these trials that compared these two things head to head, for reasons that are not exactly clear to me, older patients did better with CEA and younger patients did better with stenting. I'm not exactly sure why. I mean, the, basically, the, even the best vascular surgeons who do CEAs still have a two or three percent complication rate. Um, and stenting, is, it, works, it works just as well, um, but the long-term benefits of stenting are not quite as good as the long-term benefits of endarterectomy. Um, so there's, there's no right answer, and it often is a patient, patient and provider preference to figure out which is better. Another good question. Okay, so I, I actually have a question. You mentioned earlier intracranial atherosclerosis, which I think is, correct me if I'm wrong, but something that's usually not seen until an angiogram is done. And so can you talk a little bit about the management of that when it's identified? Yeah, great question. So these patients with intracranial athero, patients get carotid dopplers a lot. PCPs here are brewery, they get some for carotid doppler and you can find it that way. But intracranial athero, you need to have an angiogram or a CTA, CT angiogram to find that. Um, and as far as management of that, there's been trials looking at stenting of intracranial atherosclerosis in people with, let's say, a 70% right MCA stenosis who have a right MCA territory stroke or right MCA um, TIA event. Um, but in those trials, the medical management of those patients, they did astronomically better than with stenting. On multiple stents, multiple devices, um, just for, again, reasons that are not exactly clear to me, it may be a device design sort of thing, um, but when that's found, it sort of uh, makes us ramp up medical management to do dual antiplatelets for a short time, high dose statin, that sort of thing. Okay, great. Looks like we have a few other questions. So first, what is the future of stroke management after the positive stroke trials? What's FDA approved as far as intervention procedures are concerned? Yeah, great question. So. One of the things that we actually are looking at here at Vanderbilt is in terms of stroke systems of care. So other places, I think Cleveland, Houston, Cincinnati, maybe Memphis, they actually have like mobile stroke units, whereas an ambulance that has a CT scanner on the ambulance and you drive out, like that's the special ambulance that's, that is sent when they're worried about someone having a stroke. 
there's like a neurologist who sees the patient either real in real life or virtually someone who's reading the CT scan quickly, they can give TPA like on the ambulance and route to the hospital. That's one thing. And another thing is if, again, we have a big teleneurology network here, um, we have a big tele teleneurology network here where we use a, a lot of patients who are closer to a local hospital than they are to, to Vanderbilt. So the question is, do you stop at um, the local hospital to get IV TPA and then go to the bigger facility where you can get intervention, or do you skip the small hospital and go right to the big hospital? Um, intervention works so much better than IV TPA, but a lot of these trials didn't really compare IV TPA to intervention head-to-head. -head. Um, good question. And as far as intervention is concerned, a lot of them have device exemptions, um, but consent is tricky for those things, unlike IV TPA, which in the normal window you can just give to patients as a standard of care. Next question. How reliable is CTP for estimating the size of the core infarct and the amount of salvageable brain? That's another really good question. Um, not perfect. Um, and there's a lot of things, like if someone has a chronically occluded vessel or if someone has asymptomatic carotid disease, their CT perfusion might be abnormal. Um, but we, at least here, we every week go through all of our patients who have gotten TPA or have gotten intervention, and it's it's pretty pretty good between the infarct core on CTP um, and what an MRI ends up showing in that patient after they've had a successful intervention. You know, so definitely not 100% with known risk factor, you know, known imperfections, i.e., the patient's moving, the contrast bolus was mistimed, but in general, it's pretty it's pretty good. Right. Next question is uh, sort of a follow-up from the person who asked the previous question. I was asking if you could shed some light on intracranial atherosclerotic disease, which we touched on a little bit, and asking specifically if there's a future after the negative IMS3 trial. That's a good question. You know, I'm, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think just like with thrombectomy, that those trials did really great after we found the right devices. It wasn't until first and second, second generation stent retrievers as opposed to the old Mercy and Multi-Mercy and Penumbra and Solitaire and all that. It wasn't until we got the new stent retrievers that we really had such positive results. So I think for intracranial athero, I think there's a huge possibility for stenting to work. It's just a matter of finding the right, the right, getting the right device designed and the right procedure done. Now that this, now that thrombectomy is being done so commonly and so effectively and so well, I think that there's a nice market for that to be developed, um, but I'm interested to see uh, the big stroke meeting is coming up next month, and uh, I imagine they'll talk about that there. Good question. Yeah, great. I think that's, you know, most of the people tuning in are probably interested in IR and various endovascular therapies, and if you look at certain things with endovascular devices, and that's been kind of the trend is the, the first devices that come out have various problems, whether it's the large caliber of them, which has various risks, and then sometimes initial trials show that uh, these are um, no better or even worse yeah. than medical management. Uh, later on down the line, sometimes there uh, is improvement, as you surmised, could be the case. 